I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And I'm Epidiah. And we are here today to talk about Epidiah's amazing new tabletop role-playing game, Wolfspell. Let's, Let's do this. All right, welcome to the show, uh, Epi. How you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Uh, you know, good, considered. I guess that's yep. what, what everyone yeah. would say these days, was, right? My stock line that... is there's an asterisk there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> good <laughs> asterisk. All right, so you know we're going to talk primarily, I guess, about Wolf Spell today, obviously, because mm-hmm. that's your new your new hotness. Uh, yeah. We'll talk about other things later. All right, so so Wolf Spell, this this big oh, yeah. vinyl yeah. album cover <laughs> situation here, right? Uh, so I think that what the meme is what this appeared in Swords Without Master or yes. Wor- Worlds Without Master Volume Two, Issue yes. Two. That is correct. Yeah, so I noticed that on Twitter a lot. It's always like Wolfspell appeared in Worlds Without Master number two. Swords yeah. Without Master appeared in, you know, yeah. Worlds Without Master number three. Right? What's the? Let's first address what's the Worlds Without Master. Right? Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna say six years ago. I don't know how old I am anymore. I don't know how old anything <laughs> is anymore. But somewhere around six years ago, I did a digital magazine, a Sword and Sorcery magazine, for uh, eleven issues. Uh, called Worlds Without Master, uh, which included sword and sorcery fiction, and each one had a game in it uh, because I I knew that if I if I was selling something, I was more likely to sell something with a game in it than I was to just be like, mm. hey, enjoy my fiction. Mm. And each one has a, a little sword and sorcery comic in it because I have uh, fondness for the old Dragon magazines and the the comics that are in there, and. Um, yeah, it was uh, something that came about when Patreon first showed up because uh, it looked like a way to fund something like that. Uh, mm. Not uh, not rolling in cash, so I can't just make a magazine, which is you know a dying industry anyways. I have to like somehow <laughs> budget. So uh, for a while there, uh, it wasn't like a monthly or bi monthly schedule. It was like uh, whenever I get done with an issue. I get done with an issue schedule. Uh, but for a while there, I had this sort of pressure to get games done and put in, which was good. It was like a creative drive. Some of the games in there are not mine, but some of them are mine. Um, and the first issue had uh, a game called Enter the Avenger, which isn't one of mine. Um, but I have a, a piece of short fiction in each one. And in the second issue i was writing a story for it called one winter's dew and this story is a uh it's about a group of adventurers who have to turn themselves into wolves in order to solve a problem (laughs) and i wrote that story and halfway through that story i was like am i i really i really enjoy that story i really really like that story but i was wondering am i wasting a really good role-playing game on a on a piece of short fiction oh. or would i waste a really good piece of short fiction on a role playing game like what what's and then uh that's i was like well i don't have a game for this issue so why don't i write that role playing game and Ooh. that's the origin of wolf spell that's fascinating cuz usually i see the opposite if someone has a game and then they write a story using the game yeah it was i mean it was the premise itself was so uh captivating to me um just this this idea that they had in the story it's this like problem with oaths that they've taken they have to like solve a blood debt and and one of them has taken an of these two sisters one has taken an oath n- not to do it and the other has taken an oath to make sure it gets done and uh so they're like well if we if we keep doing it it'll just go back and forth and these two families will keep killing each other but if some wolves happen to kill them then maybe (laughs) we can, uh, and it goes downhill from there. Um, like all good adventures do. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, so yeah, I really like this idea of these adventurers who have put themselves in the bodies, but also somewhat in the minds of wolves. And so the game kind of comes out of that duality. You play adventurers, uh, of the sword and sorcery type the, of the kind that we all are familiar with in our fantasy role-playing games uh, who are at a point in their lives where they need in order to accomplish something in order to 
solve some dire quest, they have to transform into wolves. So the game starts off with you choosing uh, which characters fit what kind of archetypes, and then you become wolves. And you interact with the world as wolves with human minds, uh, and you try to solve, you try to uh, complete your quest and see in the end if you manage to return to human form. I say human, I, I try to hedge my bets on human there because I like if people want to play elves that do it, I'm fine with that. Mm. Like, I just oh, didn't write, I hadn't even considered that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just didn't write elf rules into the game. <laughs> Uh, would, but would you need to? Because like you're playing the game once you're being a wolf, right? Yeah, All exactly. Stuff is outside. The, you know. Yeah. So I like in in the text I use the word civ civilization to represent the the quote unquote human mind, or it's the blood dye. That way, if people are like, we're I mean, because it'd be a lot of fun to be like a bunch of dwarves who have to turn into mountain wolves to deal with uh, something. I think we know what we're doing next time we play wolf. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I didn't want to like step on those toes at all. So mm. now I, you've you've done better. You've shown toes I didn't even see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so mechanically, mm -hmm. like the game is fairly straightforward. Like we've played it with our group, and we'll maybe talk about our first experiences with it. But like, what were the mechanics you really focused on to make your story work, or to make the game tell the kind of story you wanted? So you've got two dice in the game. You have your blood die and your wolf die. They're both six-sided dice, and you're going to roll them, and you're going to look to see which one is higher. Uh, and this determines for your character what side of your character is in charge, right? And depending on uh, which die is higher, it's going to limit your options to things that a human would do or be capable of doing. Uh, again, you're in wolf, in the body of, of wolves, so it's more about, like, how a human would look at a situation and less like having opposable thumbs or anything like that. Mm. Uh, and if the wolf dies higher, then you kind of embrace those instincts and uh, you do the sort of thing that a wolf would do. And in the game, I did, like, I don't know, I don't make it terribly evident, but like the things that wolves do are keep themselves safe and away from harm, <laughs> which is a thing that human adventurers don't. Right. So if you want to oh. throw yourself at the danger, uh, getting the human side is actually better than the wolf side. Uh, but you're more likely to end up sacrificing yourself or, or some member of the party doing that. Uh, the wolf, the human has like, like if you look at the world, the human gets to ask all these analytical questions about what's going on. Whereas the wolf is like, what do I smell? What do I taste? You know, it's it's more of the the more visceral um, side of things. And uh, so you have that duality. And then to kind of uh, nail that home, there is one stat, which is your feral. <laughs> and uh, that goes up as you play the game. And the higher it gets, you just add it to your wolf die. So you just get better and better at being a wolf, which generally speaking, makes your life easier until the very end and, you know, I'm not going to worry about spoilers here or anything like that. Yeah. At the very end, you got to make a roll to see if you're going to be human again. And that feral is going to is going to bite you. Right. Like the higher your feral <laughs> score is, the less likely you are to become human. Although, like some of those results, if you're if you're like, yeah, I wouldn't mind being a wolf, then, yeah, go for it. Uh, the worst results are if you roll the, if the dice are similar um, in size, right? Like if they tie, that's bad. Uh, and especially in that last one, if they tie, you end up not, not comfortable in e either situation. That actually happened to the, my first play of this. That was exactly what happened. I went very feral, but the way things went, my die rolls, I had a very, uh, for the character, unsatisfying ending, not the player, but for the character. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so if you notice like people playing your game, uh, like feedback you get, or you playing it, do people tend to try to remain human do you find players tend to like dive into the wolf side and just like i'll be a wolf forever let's roll like how does that tend to play out it's it's really uh it's a fun meta game for me to play when i run it uh because you sit down um for me like my favorite moment running the game is we go through we make the the 
adventurers, you know, which is just basically saying, I'm the one that kills people and I'm the one that knows magic, you know, whatever. I don't want to dismiss my mechanics, but it's yeah. very simple. It's very simple. Uh, and then there's that moment uh, in the game. I got to open my book. One second. The book for the listener is a, yeah. <laughs> is a record like album cover. It's We'll, it's t- we'll a, talk about that. <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> Uh, where it says, you are now wolves. Describe your coat, your size, your scent, and your voice. And, like, that's the moment when everyone, when it becomes very real to everyone that they're a, they're a wolf. Because they have, they're like, I don't, very few people think of how their player characters smell, I think. <laughs> I th- or, you know, like that kind of. And then once that happens, I I can start laying bets on who is going to, like who wants a, a tragic story out of this? Who's like, I'm going to be a wolf till the end of time. Mm. Uh, and who's going to be like, oh, oh, wait a minute. I didn't want to be this. Like, or not, not the player, but like they realize that their character is like, mm. I want out of this. I, I want to, I want to get back mm. to my, the streets of humanity, uh, get back to cheating people at cards or whatever <laughs> it is that they do that. Yeah. Yeah, I think when we played, I ran the game and I actually had, I made sure everyone read the rules in advance. Yeah. So they sort of knew, but I would, I, when I ran it, I still went through everything in order, but I had to remind everyone from the beginning, like, you're not wolves yet. You're not wolves yet. Yeah. yeah. Now you're wolves, right? <laughs> and, you know, but I could, I was able to see that same thing only earlier because people having read it in advance already had wolf on the brain yeah, from, the, from yeah. the start, right? But then some of them, a few of our players did, I, like, in terms of the order, I'm curious how much, like, how you crafted the character creation bit, because it basically assumes you don't have a character idea in mind in advance, and the way the questioning worked, a lot of our players ended up with characters that were probably very different from what they envisioned coming in, but then when as soon as they became wolves, they had that same sort of moment of realization, and some of the people who I expected would be very down with the wolf, after their character got created, they described their wolf, and then they really tried to become human again because they liked that character that had come out of the yeah. questioning. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love questions. <laughs> yeah, that's a uh, that goes way back for me. Um, it's a yeah, great Dr- way. To... Dredd uses the questions too, right? Yeah, so yeah. That questions. Is the the only character creation mechanic in Dread is just to ask these leading questions. Because and it, this serves a similar function that it does in Dread, where it, it really kind of uh fits you into that character you you it you invest in it right it's in uh you've spent the time thinking about it and then you're like oh no (laughs) like (laughs) i was totally ready to throw this character away and be a good doggo uh but whoops um i know that doesn't happen to everyone obviously but like yeah i i definitely wanted that there's also an artifact to how this is done where i wanted it open enough that people could throw it onto uh, uh, ongoing campaign in another system if they want it. Ah. Uh, if they, uh, so there's like, it's open enough to, you could play that character creation and it's just converting the character to wolf spell, right? Like that's uh, just answering those questions. And I, I mean, you'd have to do a little bit more work than that, but not, not a ton. I, I wanted to make it obvious, but um, you know, I didn't want to, Oh, and the other thing is that, like, I don't think it's a good idea for every group to take an ongoing campaign and play Wolf Spell because you, you're going to lose characters. <laughs> like, that's oh, a... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, both, both to, like, becoming wolves, which, you know, you know, if you got an ongoing Burning Wheel campaign and you're like, well, now I get to make up a wolf, uh, give me that monster burner. That's, you know, that might be... A th- yeah, I, I would enjoy that. But also the there's a frailty to the characters that I think people don't expect until the first wolf gets injured. And then, you know, you read these um, the uh, rules for for harm. Um, ah, Got to open my book again. Yep, we definitely saw that <laughs> our, our players as soon as there was real danger for right. the first time, everyone backed the heck off. Right. Yeah, <laughs> I just want to point I point out this to listeners whenever there's any kind of RPG thing going on. Right. It's like, look, here's the person who made the game checking the book already for the second time. Yeah. Right. This is not out of the ordinary in any way whatsoever. <laughs> no, I I tell people like 
I, I write these in a book for a reason. I don't right. have to. Rem- I don't want to have to remember this shit. <laughs> like, this- <laughs> right. Um. Yeah. The the suffering harm when 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 you suffer harm in the game, uh, there are three options. Uh, one of them increases your feral. Uh, um, it either increases or decreases. It's up to you, and you get like a scar. One of them is that you lose a limb or an eye, and then another one's you're dead. And, yeah. and you you pick one of those three, and you can't pick that one again next time. Mm-hmm. And I think the first time someone goes through that list, everyone else in the group is like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Wolves are badass, but, like, they're also mortal creatures. So I just want to go back to the leading questions mechanic for a second. Yeah. At least for me, the thing I like about it a lot is it feels like you're doing a collaborative uh, creation because the person asking the question sort of yeah. gets to decide something about your character and then mm. you decide the rest. So it's like, it's always like a team effort. Um, you know, it's easy to see in retrospect, but there's no way I could have thought of that out of nothing. Right. Yeah. So like, yeah. where did that like idea of using the leading questions like originate from? So I, there's like two sort of origins there. One of them is running dread at conventions, uh, yeah, I'd like that game is uh, f- 15. No, it would. OK, I've been running Dread at conventions. I first started running. Let me put it this way. I first started running Dread at conventions 20 years ago. So that's <laughs> uh, the game yeah. itself is like the, the book that everyone knows is about 15 years old. But we were running it for about five years before we published the book. Uh, and we ran it all the time, just constantly. Uh, and one of the things that, that started to happen is that you just get not to knock the game. I just, you just get bored of it, right? Like you, you, as the, I'm sure this happens with musicians. I'm sure that they have songs that they just don't, if they never had to play them again, they'd be happy, you know, or, mm. you know, and I don't have a problem with dread, but like having to come up with all of those questions again. So it, what I did was I just started to, <clears throat> excuse me, I started to create a little demo that I could do that ran faster than normal dread and forced other people to come up with those questions for everyone else. Mm. Uh, I was just like, we're just going to go around. It, I mean, it's essentially what's in here in, in Wolf Spell where you just go around and ask questions. Uh, and it did, I noticed that it did these, these two things. Like it, 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 it told me what each player wanted from the situation, right? Like I could see, I, you could see what what they what they were interested in, and then the other part that kind of solidified that is uh, Swords Without Master was published in the issue right after Wolfspell uh, uh, in Worlds, but it had been written before Wolfspell, and in Swords Without Master, one of the design uh, edicts was that no Two pe- uh, no one person could decide anything. Like all the rules mm. are focused on one person bringing half the equation in, and then the other person bringing the other half. So it had a lot of that 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 duality of like I'll ask you a leading question, or I will make a demand of you, and you answer that demand. Um, because I, I find that more. Oh, I just, it's more interesting to me when I play, like to mm. have, even if I'm not one of the two people coming up with it, I, it, it just feels more engaging to me to have, and rather than have like one person monologue or, or whatever, uh, not to, to, you know, however people want to play is fine by them. I yeah. just, I design games that I enjoy playing. Uh, I think I would go, uh, a little, uh, a little, um, a little off the rails if I didn't. Yeah. So, so how yeah. leading do you see players tend to do this? Because our group, with those leading questions, people went right for the throat with things like, how did yeah. you lose your eye? Why did you murder your companion? Like, they well, just went... the first round of questions, they didn't quite get it. But then as soon as this, you know, as soon as someone gives a good example, right, of like a yeah. leading question, everyone else goes, oh, <laughs> yeah. and then every question from then on is a, is a killer. I think I think that's exactly is you just need one person to just uh, dip their toes into the the forbidden waters <laughs> and then everyone's like oh hold on because <laughs> because we you there's a there's definitely a culture uh, that that has been like sort of handed down to role playing in general through D and D that like 
sometimes is it's not evident that you can step out of sight outside of certain boundaries that would you know i feel like in a lot of DD games you wouldn't be allowed to ask these kind of questions and go with them mm. I, it wouldn't necessarily break the game to do that but i think that that's uh people would be like oh and but so yeah once you get a l- little taste of it you're like oh okay yes let's let's see how and it, it's helpful that it's usually just a one shot you're just playing um you know the this this one story out uh so yeah why not go for it right like you're not ruining somebody's character for again like a campaign or anything like that um Mm -hmm. although i have played uh um return returning games of wolf spell which is uh a particularly fun thing to do when you have characters that have become wolves and now you've got those players playing new people you know what I mean? Like the, the the players who in the previous game were unable to return back to human form, and so they're like, "Oh, I'm going to make a new character," and then they meet the the wolf from the previous game in the wild, and oh, mm. that's just a wonderful moment. Oh, I see. <laughs> but the people who return who who turned back into non wolves are going to wolf a second time. Yeah, some of like, them do. I've some seen of them are like, "Before here we <laughs> go again." How bad could it be? Yeah, I know how to do this. Um, and when I did it, the even had people change the um, their the who they were in the pack. Like they like uh, go from being uh, the the shifty one, the one that that nobody knows where they the the one that's good at lying and being sneaky, <laughs> to the one with the sword arm because they're like, no, I've changed. <laughs> this is a, this is a different character now, and this is uh, this is who I am. So in terms Which of. Sin- Oh, in terms yeah. of the scenarios, like, because uh, you're talking about these rails to make this easy to set up, like, the game sort of has a list of these are the no, reasons you're a wolf. I was going like, to ask about this. What you're after. Yeah. So how did how did you decide on that set? Because it's a very short list. Like, how what was what were your goals in those? Well, it used to be shorter, right? They... Yeah, yeah. It's slightly longer. And um, I have ones that haven't made it to this. Uh, okay, so, uh, like, we <laughs> part of... Part of what happened was, all right, so we've got the the version of Wolf Spell that shows up in Worlds Without Master. And uh, that one is both has like a time constraint. Like I had to, fin- I think I, I finished that one in a month and a half. Uh, and, uh, and then also like I had, um, so my rules for, for Worlds Without Master, I had like a, a word count and I, uh, didn't let anyone go over it because I had a budget and I was like, I want to pay you a, 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 a reasonable rate for what you're doing here. Do not go over this word count. Cause I cannot afford anything beyond you know, mm. these words. Uh, so the rules were like, nobody gets cheated out of money or out of what they're owed in worlds, unless their name is Epi. So Epi could go over the word count a little <laughs> bit, but I had to be very reasonable about that. Um, so there was this th- that pressure, and then of course, when when it came to this final form, this this trifold album cover, I had again. Uh, there's extra material I wanted to put in here. Isn't there? Isn't a whole lot of it, but a lot of it is like to kind of clarify some things. I rewrote a few of the the moves to just uh, further explain what I wanted to do with them, uh, and I've changed up some of these spells. And I did. I came up with. Um, quite a few more spells and a, and a f- even a few more pack members but uh f- ultimately it just didn't fit the 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 layout and mm. i was you know uh threw them out there was early early days when shell and i were shell um khan who's the artist who who uh did this amazing cover uh when we were talking about it i was thinking about putting like the pack members or the wolf spells as track listings on it ha. Uh, oh. yeah but in the end i look at that art and i can't i cannot put anything over top of it right like i i was it was I, we even left like a little space where it might work and i was just in the end i was like no i can't i can't bring myself to doing mm-hmm. that um but i you know uh yeah so i wanted to come up with I locked myself into something of a setting by naming the the game master Winter, and that mm. is uh, because it came out of that uh, that story, and that story took place during the winter. 
uh, I don't play all my games during the winter. Uh, so we have like oh, okay. summer games and I, I play a character named Winter, you know, or I'm, <laughs> I'm the game master called Winter anyways. Um, but uh, I, that, I mean, there's this thing about when you, when you make a game, you don't want to make the fullest game. You want to leave bits there for people to uh, kind of build their own game off of. So like I was, I was perfectly happy to say stuff like, uh, we'll call it winter, but if you can figure out that you can play it, you know, in the summer and, Mm. you know, or, or whatever. Um, Do you think players get that? Like, some I feel like some RPG players will read the rules and follow them exactly, and they set a hundred percent like sacrosanct guardrails. And some players take the rules and they see the gaps and they try to drive as hard toward those gaps as possible. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, I think everyone's got their own thing, but like you, 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 can, it's easy to design for both. If you make a complete game that works but has this this room for play mm. uh, and then tr- don't try to like because uh, in the beginning uh, in the beginning <laughs> back, <laughs> I used to be like I wanted to tell everyone all of my ideas for how the different ways that this game would work uh, and then in the end I just kind of got to this thing where I was like if I do that it's just a list of things that people will get bored of reading at some point, right? They won't go through it and look for, I mean, you can give them a list of things and give them some ideas of the directions that things can go. uh, But fundamentally they're going to come up with their own. uh, So you just kind of want to leave, leave room for that to happen, right? Mm -hmm. Like you want to let them uh, exercise their own design minds. Uh, Yeah. So, so speaking of winter, one thing I noticed when I, when I was winter, was yeah. I actually had a difficult time. Uh, it could be because just the way the players played, applying Winter's Wrath. I was like, I'm going to get Winter's Wrath on somebody. It's written all over this book, <laughs> right? And every time I had a chance to do it, someone had a thing that said, nope, get Winter's Wrath. And I couldn't figure <laughs> out how to get the Winter's Wrath. It happened zero <laughs> times. Oh, uh, interesting. So is there was there something I'm missing? or? Well, I mean, like, it's... Uh... Winter's Wrath is one of those, to some extent, it's there to soak up some of those, oh, I've got an extra thing to, you know, put in here. Like, um, it's it's basically a way to punish people, not punish people. <laughs> Hold on, I'm going to come back. That's a really bad way to put it. Uh, it's it's a way to create a consequence for, for actions uh, that isn't immediate, right? Uh, so the effect of Winter's Wrath, generally speaking, is that when you face the peril, you're going to be in trouble. You're you're going to have, um, and I didn't want like uh, hit points. I mean, we have something akin to hit points in the harm, you know. But yeah. uh, uh, so I wanted something that said, "Hey, you're you're feeling blue because you couldn't wrestle. Uh, mm. So now, when something bad happens, you're just not you. You're in that you know as the pack is loping across the 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 planes or whatever the tundra uh you're at a spot where you're vulnerable because you don't feel like you're a part of the pack you're I maybe you. out a little bit further than everyone else or something like that so when the peril hits the the winter is going to focus on you mm. uh, i think it's okay if nobody gets it uh but i also that's probably due to some pretty good rolling or maybe they were just like yeah. nobody everyone was like i don't want to be left out of this pack i don't right. want to be well yeah. i think yeah i think what it, now that you talk about the the immediate versus the delayed consequence i do remember people will seem to be intentionally opting for the immediate consequence yeah. it's like yeah it i good winter's wrath but basically they suffered consequences immediately every time something bad happened right mm-hmm. they didn't you know try to push them off to hold out longer we also had yeah. players very willing to sacrifice themselves for each other and we had a few like very i am a wolf let's roll characters <laughs> who were really just like i want to stay a wolf forever this is better than yeah. my human life <laughs> and and the other thing about winter's wrath uh to maybe make you feel a little better is that it's easy to get rid of. You just groom with the pack, yeah. like, yes. uh, which was intentional. I wanted people to just be like, oh, you know what? I'm not feeling good. Maybe we just hang out. We'll pick lice off of each other or whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> we'll deal with some pests and 
there's also that rule, right? I think where it's like at immediate, at least immediately after grooming or wrestling, you can't be immediate peril to sort yeah. of force force the the flow, the narrative flow to not be like you know you're yeah. hanging out. Suddenly a bear comes because <laughs> yeah. there's a certain uh, temptation to do that. I think like um, there's there's drama. Uh, for instance, like in, in uh, horror movies, that happens all the time. Anytime people are relaxed, you're like, OK, here it comes. You know, like <laughs> this is the, this is the thing. And uh, that shows up in action movies as well. And I just wanted to be like, hey, it, don't punish the players for being wolves. Like, that's why we're playing. You know, mm. we're we're going to wrestle for a bit. We're going to groom for a bit. We're just going to enjoy it. And then, you know. The way the game works for me, generally speaking, is that like, you know, you have those things that just let the players do wolfy things that uh, are of, I don't want to say of less consequence, but like, because wrestling can actually have some pretty bad consequences yeah. if, you're, if you're not, you know, but are, are more playful and more um, less central to your quest, right? Less central to, you know, where the human mind is focused. And then for me, if I'm the winter, it's all in the uh, beholding the world move. I just like anytime somebody like we don't know what to do. I'm like, does anyone want to behold the world? Because that series of questions and back and forth usually inspires something, right? Like if I'm just sitting there going, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't. And then somebody's like, uh, I'm chewing on this log. What can that tell me? Yeah. I'm like, oh. Oh yeah, what can that tell you? Like <laughs> this is interesting. Um, that's so, interesting yeah. because that's exactly what Scott ended up doing. You you would basically get us to behold the world, and then you would sort of come up with what's going on from there, and that pattern just emerged over and over and over again right. during game during play. Right. Yeah. It's it's it goes back to the leading question, right? Or it's yeah. like beholding the world. They're sort of asking Winter leading questions, right, to fill in you know, about what happens next rather than what's your character like. I particularly like the what am I missing style question. Like, what should yeah. I have paid attention to that I did? Like, anything like that, which you've done in this game, just always seems to really ratchet the the slow tension up. Yeah, when, um, when you roll a tie in the game, uh, so basically, uh, for the listeners, is you roll these two dice, you look for which one's higher, and you subtract the lower one from the higher. So you're the gradient of how well you do is based on the difference between the two dice. If you roll a tie, you pick whether you want to have like a one of wolf or a one of blood. And those are some of my favorite decisions in the game. Some of them are just obvious and it's whatever that that's great. You know, the situation just makes it obvious, but like, it's the like, oh, do I want a bad wolf thing to happen or I want a bad human thing to happen mm. <laughs> like that's the uh I really enjoy when when that comes up because it, it's it's that exact thing where it's like what should I have noticed that I didn't or you know how how are my wolf senses uh making me scared right now when, when or I again checking my rule <laughs> yeah uh ask the winter what sight sound sense or taste confuse or scare you right mm. like yeah all right, so this amazing game, Wolf's Fell, was in issue two out of, you said, 11. There's 11 total issues? Yeah, right? yeah. So why did this one be the one to go for Kickstarter, get its own thing, and not, <laughs> and not any of the 10 other right. games that appeared? Well, okay, so the, several of the other ones um, are, like I said, are other people's games. I think uh, Nathan D. Paoletta did uh, in... Um, the Tomb of the Mummy King. And I think, I don't remember if he did a Kickstarter for it, but it definitely has its own physical form. It's out there. Okay. Um, uh, and it beat me to the punch because I'm, I'm usually slow in these. What <laughs> happened here was um, I wrote that story and I knew the artist I wanted to illustrate the story. So I contacted Shell, Shell Khan, mm -hmm. and they uh, did these gorgeous uh, pictures. They're, in the story, there's like a giant owl that it takes, attacks the wolves and it's like above and beyond when it comes to like uh what what i was expecting um and uh so like i i really really dug that and i that's when 
I think, I mean, I can't tell you when it actually formed in my head, but like I knew for a while there that I was like, I'm going to publish a game on a record album and I, you know, <laughs> which one and like what artist can I get? Like, uh, and so that's what made me, I was like, I'm going to do Wolf Spell and have Shell do the art for it. And then was up in, uh, Canada at a convention where, uh, Shell happened to be at as well. And we were, we were hanging out at, in a cafe afterwards talking about this and they just pulled out a notepad and sketched out this mountain wolf that's on the cover, right? So this Ooh. cover is, uh, it's a trifold. So it's got these three panels. And if you go from the left to the right, you've got a bunch of adventurers, uh, out on a mountain and then you have a bunch of wolves out on a mountain and then the mountain itself turns out to be the back of a giant wolf. And it was just, I was like, oh yeah. Like this, <laughs> oh, this actually, yeah. To- <laughs> I'm seeing a lot more than I saw the last time I looked at this. There are so many hidden wolves on this cover. <laughs> like that's a game in and of itself. Find the, oh man. There, yeah, yeah, definitely seeing at least three hidden wolves I didn't see previously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I feel like we got to uh, back up. I bro. Why an album cover? How long have you been stewing on that idea? Oh, I like I've been stewing on that one for for a while. I the originally I wanted to do Swords Without Master in that format. Like I was going to have it like a book that was a 12 by 12 book until like I talked to actual printers and they were like, "Yeah, uh here is the vast amounts of gold you will need to accomplish that <laughs> i was like yeah. oh okay yeah uh so um and the, the i think in 2010 2010 or 11 somewhere in there i i had done a preview of swords uh that I had public that like this it's so bad. It's so bad. Uh, I did the cover art myself. It is not good. <laughs> uh, there was interior art. That's great. Like I paid actual artists to do some great interior art. Um, and uh, I printed that as a uh, square uh, album. I don't, it wasn't, I don't believe it was album size. I was, I would think it was like uh, a more reasonable, like nine by nine or something that like uh, printers could do. Uh, and it wasn't, you know, I think I'd be surprised if it was 16 pages. It, it was it was uh, pretty small that I took to to Gen Con to kind of show off and, and whatnot uh, and said, I'll have this done in a moment. And, and it took me five years, I guess, is that moment <laughs> to put it out in issue three. Um, it, uh, the other thing about Worlds is that Worlds Without Master created an excuse for me to publish games that I otherwise was like, I need to make this a beautiful game. And then you know, the perfect being the enemy of done, you know, that kind of thing. So yep, worlds yep. was like, why don't you publish it here? Um, so when it came around to it, I thought, well, wolf spell is about the size. And I went looking online to find like uh, places that, that make these album covers and downloading their layouts and, and throwing it in. And it did, it fit. Like I didn't have to like also write a booklet that I'd have to hand insert. Cause like, Mm. Again, all, all of that stuff ends up it's just more and more money and more and more, you know, either I have to hand insert them or I have to pay someone to do it or, or uh, yeah, it just gets uh, out of control. Mm. Uh, and then I thought this is going to be my first Kickstarter. I wanted to make, um, like I had the game already written. I, uh, I was going to do some rewrites and do some editing passes. I did like thousands of editing passes. <laughs> uh, and I wanted to like get this gorgeous art for it, but then otherwise is a pretty straightforward Kickstarter. I didn't want to do anything complicated with a lot of stretch goals or, mm-hmm. you know, like uh, I didn't want a lot of moving parts. So I was yep. like, here's the thing. That's it. Uh, this is what I need to fund it. And let's go. No stretch goal of here's a vinyl of me reading the rules to you. Right. A lot of people wanted uh, a record and I, I had to keep telling people I'm a game designer, not a record producer. Like I'm not <laughs> like, like I'm going for the aesthetic. And then like, so now there's a, there's a, it's not a game. It's an adventure. Uh, oh, 
All right, I'm going to look this up. I think it's like Death Jungle Robot. <laughs> I haven't heard of it. <laughs> uh, Death Robot Jungle. I had them in the wrong order. Okay. Uh, and this is a uh, adventure thing um, setting. It. So it's a it's an album cover. It comes with vinyl. It comes with its own music. So that like it's this whole thing plus an album. So uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to them. Uh, I should get a hold of that game at some point. Um, Maybe I should too. It's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I don't have a I don't have a, a turntable. <laughs> yeah. That, but that's that was that was it for me too. Like I don't. I uh, and uh, like the other thing is like how do you. Like I would have loved to have had like a bunch of bands that I enjoy on here, but also, like, uh, yeah, that's uh, just a whole lot of more work. And like I said, I am not not a record producer, and nor nor should anyone be subject to my taste in music. That's the <laughs> other thing I should <laughs> like. Right. Actually, that's yeah. a, that's a fun side question. Uh, what kind of music do you like? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, like I'm into metal, I'm into prog rock. Uh, I'm into, uh, I do enjoy, uh, quite a bit, uh, of music of, you know, different varieties and whatnot. Like, th but this cover is because like for me, uh, metal and you know, the, the old prog rock albums and things like that, uh, that, hit my life the same time that role-playing games did right like ah. it, it, the mind expanding drugs of black sabbath and you know fantasy role-playing games all at once <laughs> <laughs> uh so they're intrinsically connected in my brain uh so that was i guess the the reason why i wanted to do like an album cover because i i you know have these old albums and just spend hours staring at the cover while listening to the music and i wanted to kind of uh pay homage to that experience if if not recreate it so clearly you know the fact that i have this game and i've played it right indicates mm -hmm. the kickstarter is long over yes <laughs> right? so if somebody out there listening wants to get this game right how would yeah. they how would they do that today as uh, kickstarter is no longer an option the easiest uh, way would be to go to worldswithoutmaster.com. Uh, worlds is plural uh, and master is singular. Don't, we, when you make URLs, <laughs> <laughs> don't do what Epi did, kid. Uh, and um, there's, that's where you can get all the back issues in the magazine, but also I'm selling uh, both the PDF and the uh, physical copy of this uh all i ask is that you're patient with me uh shipping these days is mm. is, is a growing nightmare um, pdfs are good yeah yeah uh and and if you buy if you buy the physical copy uh i will send you the pdfs as well so oh. uh, mm -hmm. double yeah. bonus um because yeah uh, for the longest time i had sworn off physical games and just did PDFs. And then I was like, let's get into this physical game thing. The moment a pandemic hits and then, well, I don't want to get into it. Like it's just like a, everything just kind of started falling apart right then and there when it seemed like, here we go. We're about ready to publish. Yep. I, I too was played starting things when pandemic hit as yeah. well. That, that zine uh, you were talking not, about. They're probably not going to happen until next year. Yeah. If at the earliest, right? <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so I actually want to talk about something else unrelated because sure. right, I follow you on Twitter for a long time, right? Okay. And there was a period where you're tweeting a lot of calculators. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> so so what's up with the calculators? Yeah. So this is this is a um, all right. <laughs> Dread uh, exists because a long long time ago I was like the problem with role playing games is there's too much math, um, and then. <laughs> That really is an oversimplification of how that happened. But anyways, the point is, is that I used to think that I hated math. Like I went to college and uh, got my degree in uh, English with the emphasis in creative writing because I was like, I'm not going to touch math. I'm not going to have anything to do with math. Uh, and then uh, that led to making role playing games, which led to a small business, which means you got to learn math uh, and you got to do accounting. Uh, and so I started taking some courses uh, in accounting to kind of get an understanding of what's going on, um, financially speaking with the business. And, 
there is this calculator. Uh, it's called the HP 12C. It came out in the 80s. It is still kind of considered the standard financial calculator. And um, it's one of those things, it's one of those moments in history when like uh, the technology hit the right group of people at the right time. And when you look into what this calculator can do with the memory it has and everything else, like all the technical details, it's it's astounding. It's one of those like just well-crafted pieces of, of uh, technology. Uh, and it's part of a, um, a line of calculators. There's like a scientific one, uh, the HP 15C, uh, which the 12C is a financial calculator, which does like do your mortgage on it or you know that kind of thing the 15c is going to help you with your trigonometry and and mm -hmm. do like uh in integrals and things like that but uh it doesn't work like most people think of a calculator uh it, it uses what's called rpn which is this reverse polish notation that's what it stands for uh and in a normal calculator situation you'd be like two plus three equals and this one is two inter three plus. Uh, you basically, you have this stack and you put your numbers on the stack and then you decide the operations that you're going to do to the two lowest numbers on the stack and you just kind of go through it that way. Mm. I, I cannot truly describe what happened in my brain when I tried that. But it was <laughs> like, this is how I've always thought of math. And this is... This is different. And the other thing about these calculators is that they're programmable as like keystroke programmable. Like you can get it to remember the key order that you've typed things in. So you could, you could, well, you can program it to do like a bunch of interesting things, but it had these great creative constraints, right? Like it's just, you know, you weren't able to like, uh, it's not programmable like a, um, well, like your computer is, or, you know, it's not like it's got a, java running on it or anything like that it's just these keystrokes and so that set of creative constraints uh and just enough keys on it that were a mystery to me like i didn't at the time didn't know what a natural logarithm was or why it was important or why it was considered natural uh and the fact that it like came at math at a slightly different way but a way that made kind of sense to me and i shouldn't say math i should say calculations because mm. that's what it does uh just triggered something and i just started learning math <laughs> like i just <laughs> we now uh we have near where we live here there's a, in fact actually it's the uh the distributor for wolf spell is uh, a used bookstore uh and they basically do most of their sales online especially nowadays um but they they bring in a ton of well literally a ton of books uh, from um, like charity shops and uh, Goodwills and things like that, sort them through, figure out what what they can sell online, and then they put the rest out in these giant bins out in front of the store, and they have like a little box that says the you know the cash register of truth, fifty cents a book, and it's just twenty four hours a day, and you just walk by these giant bins and just dig through it like little book raccoons right you're just like <laughs> tearing into them and it it is on a regular walk uh that em and i do from oh, our house so <laughs> yeah so <laughs> you can see us late at night sometimes we're just out for a nice lovely evening stroll and we have our cell phones out for light as we're digging through these things and i was i was like dropping a dollar or two here to bring home math textbooks right like <laughs> what is happening to me something is broken um and it's just uh, it just kind of opened the door and allowed me to see that like a lot of what's happening happens in mathematics is is just a game it's just people playing with things we kind of get treated as like this super important thing because it does allow for these amazing you know, all the, all the technology we're using right now. And uh, it's obviously on the financial side, it's, let's say, important. It at least affects everyone's <laughs> lives. <laughs> I, have, I have some qualms about that. But anyways, the point is. We agree. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's, the, it's, it's this very powerful force. But when you get down to it, when you talk to actual mathematicians, they are 
they're gamers, right? They're just like a lot of the, the, the high end mathematics is like, what if the rules are this, what would happen? And it just played into uh, that, that same mm -hmm. thing that drew me to designing role playing games in the first place. And some of these old uh, math, uh, not textbooks, but the, well, some of the textbooks as well. Actually, the really old textbooks are really neat, but the, um, the manuals for these calculators from the 70s and the 80s are kind of neat. Like I actually, I, I bought uh, a compilation of like hundreds of them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, just sometimes we'll pull one up on my phone and just read through it to see what a calculator can do. Like <laughs> this particular calculator from this particular time. Uh, it's, it, uh, you know, it's one of those, I can go on forever and I apologize, yeah. but yeah. like, no, we asked that's the question because we're, we're fascinated yeah. by this. I was like, I was like, let me throw out a little bait here. Oh, I caught the big fish. I was looking for. Hey. There's a there's a calculator. The um, it's another HP. HP, uh, particularly in the uh, 70s and 80s and uh, 90s, they they did a lot of the reverse Polish notation stuff. Uh, and um, I have like actual feelings about uh what happened to make texas instrument the base uh calculator for everyone mm. like actual angry feelings that i shouldn't have <laughs> like <laughs> i'm angry about a thing that that well anyways the point is um there's uh there's one the um hp 41 i'm gonna uh bring this up to make sure i'm not telling lies about this there's a bunch of different uh uh versions of this one but is this the one with magnetic card reader and thermal printer yes uh, yes i'm looking at the same wikipedia page you are <laughs> yeah and i see the heading use on space shuttle so there's something interesting going on here yeah like they would go up into space with these to double check their uh, the astronauts would bring them into space so that they would have something to double check the computers on like these were uh but what's really interesting about these, these came out, um, they were long lived for a calculator. They had some, uh, the, I think they advertised it as the alphanumeric revolution because the, the, um, the display, it was still like that uh, segmented display, but it, it allowed for, more, it had more segments so you can have a, a rudimentary English alphabet on it. Um, and again, you could program it. They had magnetic card readers so you can save those programs. They had a pen that was a barcode reader so you could actually print out a barcode of the program, photocopy that into little calculator zines, share them ah. at conventions, oh, snap. and have someone else scan that in. Like, if cell phones didn't happen, it could have been this, right? Like this could have been the thing that everyone had in their pocket that they were, you know. I mean, it, that's like the Game Boy had the e-reader thing, right? Where yeah. Swipe the. It's it's like there was there was a whole culture to it. Like a, a part of that, you know, eight hundred document thing that I have has a whole bunch of these zines that are are just like sometimes they're just handwritten instructions to program your calculator to do things and. All of those are windows into either other fields, like the, like um, uh, surveyors have all sorts of programs. Lots of uh, programs for um, if you're in if you're uh, a pilot, you know, uh, aerial navigation and whatnot. Lots of astronomy programs, uh, but also just like yeah, just like hobbies that math intensive hobbies that people had, and then games like people programmed games for these things they weren't fancy <laughs> the, <laughs> like the, but they and then the the uh they figured out that uh and i'm, I'm really gonna mess up how this works because i never had a physical one so i don't know uh I've, you know i've played with the apps of it or whatever but like there were ways to directly address some of the memory in the calculator Ooh. so you could go beyond what the calculator was actually capable of and you can do like hacking with it. So you could get it to like, you could make it r overclock it and all these other things that like, it just really was this whole uh, universe that um, 
I missed out on uh, partly because I'm a little too young. Like yeah. uh, those were, were, but like even and I've I've now since in my old age bought calculators that existed when I was in high school. That if I had this in my mind, uh, I would probably be like an engineer now or uh, or or, or uh, um, something in that direction rather than the direction I ended up going. I don't have regrets about that. I really enjoy what I'm doing, yeah. but like it's, it is, it is so weird to have come at it so much later in life and been like, what the hell were they teaching me? Like <laughs> I wanted to learn trigonometry, like as a 45 year old, I'm trying to figure out trigonometry. I took a whole year's worth of trigonometry in high school. I know I remember <laughs> being there. I don't remember any of this or caring about any of this. So, yeah, I feel like I have a similar thing with like cameras, right? It's like I didn't care about photography until much yeah. later in life. Mm -hmm. And I have cameras that are older than me, right? That yeah. I've, yeah. I've bought, right? <clears throat> and then I'll, I'll read manuals of cameras and like yes. look at old cameras and say, like, how did they work? Whoa, it's different <laughs> about this one. I can't afford it. I won't buy it, but you know. I'm that way with like weird old capital markets protocols, just based on okay. the way my career has gone and everything like, old. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> the bad, he's the bad guy. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. So I think we've gone on quite a bit. Um, yeah. Is there anything, what, what's coming next from, from EpiLand? What are you uh, working on? If, if, if anything. Or well, if anything you're willing to share. Yeah, I've got, um, well, okay. So, the uh i've got several things that are like at that the uh i'm trying to think of like a way to describe the stage they're on deck they're not like the the mm -hmm. thing that i you know i don't have anything that i'm about to knock out of the park there's a game that i was working on um going back to jenga and uh called it lives it wakes which is a a, a kaiju game uh yeah. yeah it's you you would take the jenga tower and you divide it up into three towers of uh different sizes and you would collectively make characters that either like live in this city that's about to be attacked by this giant monster or are responsible for it in some way or a part of like uh like a professor or some scientist or something like that and then you play out uh, a godzilla movie right like you mm -hmm. and uh depending on which character is in the scene it, de it tells you which towers you can pull from and you take some of them come from like the smallest tower is like the house and that's the family like you have like this family unit or these close related mm. people and you can take some of the blocks and put them in the other towers so you can kind of protect some of them because when that tower falls a, a character associated with that has to die ah. uh, and so you have this whole like um you know giant monster i want to like for a long time i wanted to get uh, a giant monster one I, I really, really love all of the Godzilla films uh, for a number of different reasons. But like the the element I want it to sort of take in are those moments like it is very evident in like the very first Godzilla of each era where it's horrifying to live in a city being attacked by Godzilla. Right. Like later on that that kind of falls out although it shows up again in, in some of them but like there's that that first one where it's like yeah anyways it's it's horrifying for that to have happen mm -hmm. i wanted to kind of play into that but not obviously i wanted to also allow for all of the um sort of campy stuff that happens in it but it's a jenga based game so i'm going to wait a while i'm gonna wait till people yeah. can meet <laughs> face to face yeah <laughs> Man, yeah, we play can play Wolf Spell over a Discord pretty well, right. but that would be a lot harder. <laughs> so the games I'm focusing on now, I have uh, two games that um, are sort of, in my mind, they're, they're uh, descendants of Swords Without Master. Um, one of them is a, uh, a you, it's called uh, the Gamefield Public Library Curious Research Society. And you play a bunch of people. The characters, by the rules of the game, have to be at least 45 years old. Uh, they meet mm. at a library once a month uh, to investigate the weird goings on in their town. So you have like a town that you have, and they're like old Scooby Doo people. <laughs> uh, and the and you <clears throat> roll these dice. Uh, one of the die will tell you if your hypothesis is contradicted by what happens in the narration. 
Uh, another one will tell you if somebody suffers the peril of what's happening. Uh, and it's inspired a lot by 90s horror television, like uh, Friday the 13th, the series, or oh. uh, mm. American Gothic and X-Files. and uh, American sort of... Gothic. That's a name I haven't heard in a long yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> I was weirdly obsessed with that show. Uh, I mean, uh, what's his name? Uh, Gary Cole as... The sheriff who is probably the devil. Yeah. Is he's so good. So good. Um Yeah. Uh and then the other one that I'm doing is my Robin Hood game. Um, oh. which I've been working on for quite a while. Uh that um finally made a whole lot of headway on it. That mm. uh, again, it'll it'll be um a bit like Swords of That Master, except instead of rolling tone dice, you have three coins a bold, a sly, and a stout coin, and you throw those, and somebody in your narration has to have that attribute of, like, whichever ones came up heads. So you have to be like, this is a bold character, this is a sly one, and open to interpretation. So you could be like, he's not bold, he's foolhardy, or she's not stout, she's just very stubborn, you know, that kind of Mm. thing. So... Very good. All right. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to tell us or our listeners uh, that I didn't think of? No. <laughs> We've covered the gamut. We've done we with the calculators. Yeah. We did. Yeah. This was a great time. Thanks so much <laughs> for coming on the Thank show. Thank you. Yeah, I had a lot of fun. Because yeah. we had a lot of fun with Wolfspell. And it was cool to sort of hear your thoughts on where it came from and sort of why it was crafted the way it was. And I think I'm going to read all these Wikipedia articles on calculators tonight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, great. That's da- I, I've got yeah. five tabs open. And I had to stop myself from just reading them while we were... <laughs> Every time somebody's like, hey... Did you know that people are really into sundials? I'm like, I don't need to know. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> don't tell me about the sundials. <laughs> Am I going to be into sundials? I might be. All so, right. Yeah. Well, uh, I hope you have a wonderful or as wonderful as possible Labor yeah, Day weekend. Too. And I hope to see you at a convention whenever those exist again. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Sounds lovely. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos.